Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then they hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Arnold Leone, and hopefully you are doing well for yourself. You, your friends, your family, whether you live in the States or internationally, I hope you do fine for yourself during a time of major uncertainty. Stay safe, wash your hands, it's over. just make 2020 as good as possible, considering how 2020 is right now. Let's cross your fingers. We're in August right now. Just a couple months away. My idea is that we're going through the worst year ever. The next following year, it's going to be awesome and amazing. That's what I'm hoping for right now. Uh, according to Dana White, though, he says like he really doesn't expect fans or audiences to make a return anytime soon. Well, you don't. With the way how things are going right now, we, in terms of sporting events, we can't expect fans and live attendance actually happening until potentially like I'm guessing March June of <laughs> I know it sucks right June of 2021 that's what that is when it's a for sure thing we are getting audience members but it, I don't see it happening early 2021 and according to other sources whether it be uh, also the uh, the commissioner from the NBA National Basketball Association Adam Silver he goes, he goes on to say he doesn't expect fans to come back anytime soon. We, we can expect more sporting events happen. Uh, good, yeah, sports, it's back. Yay there, but the lack of a crowd there, ah, oh man, it gets, uh, it gets really difficult to watch some of these shows, especially for basketball for me. And for the Cormier versus Stevie Miocic fight, if there was an audience there, People would be freaking out. Ah, my gosh, wow, this is awesome, this is amazing, wow, wow. But because that's not there, I'm kind of missing it. <laughs> I really am. I miss the one drunk fan in the front row being like, whoa, when he sees the camera going past him. It's kind of weird, quirky aspects of mixed martial arts and the UFC that I do miss. But today, I have a plethora of news to talk about. First off, current light... Le- I, I'm always upset by this. I hate the fact that there's like little to no stability in championships. But here's the thing. John Jones has officially vacated the light heavyweight title. He's no longer the light heavyweight champion. He is going to go and aim for being the heavyweight champion. He's a much more bigger name than Juzana Rosenstrike. Bigger name than Curtis Blades. Bigger name than JDS. Bigger name than Alistair Overeem. So John Jones, it is official. He is making his way up in the heavyweight rankings. And he's not going to do it carrying the light heavyweight belt. Thank goodness. I don't want another scenario where I'm seeing a champion versus champion fight again. Which leads to one title being vacated. Because it's been an ongoing issue right now with the UFC. With titles being vacated. Champions retiring, champions sticking by retirement, championships not even having an actual ranking system to it, champions being off for about a year, champions being gone through injury. So right now, the stability in the rankings is just incredibly annoying to deal with. It really is, and it doesn't help that we have COVID-19, and a lot of our fighters are international, and so they can't go travel to America. It just can't. But John Jones has vacated his light heavy belt. But Dana White gave an ultimatum to John Jones saying, you have two options. You can either go straight to heavyweight, vacate the belt, or you can keep your belt and fight against Dominic Reyes in your rematch. Because the Reyes versus John Jones fight, sadly, I don't expect those two fighting again. I just really don't. Unless Dominic Reyes 
is what's going to move up the rankings. Or John Jones, he has such a bad time at heavyweight, he'll move back down to light heavyweights. That'll be really sad. So, what's coming next for the light heavyweight division? Well, it is coming in from MMAFight.com. The Dana White says that Dominic Reyes versus John Blackowitz is set for a light heavyweight title at UFC 253. 250, there's a lot of stuff happening for UFC 253. Let's uh, go talk about it because a lot of fights were announced for that card. So, the UFC 53 is coming up just... Whoa, that's very interesting. Hmm. What? What? Isn't this also the card that has Paulo Costa in... Uh... Alright, let me check. Let me go check the timetables for all this, uh, for all these events here. And so, UFC 254. So, UFC 254, Derek Lewis, Alex Galenic. Okay, I'm looking. The numbers here are all messed up right now. They are all, all messed up. Okay, so September 26th is going to be UFC 253. All right. And in that card, we're going to have Paula Costa and Israel Adesanya. A lot of fights were announced in this card here, and it's not officially placed yet in the actual, like, match-to-match card here. But in a card with main event being Israel Adesanya versus Paula Costa happening on my birthday, we have Claudia Cadella against Jan Shunyan. That's a really fun one. And then we have Dominic Reyes versus John Blackwoods. Probably going to be the coming event of this card for the light heavy title here. So according to Dana White, the OC president spoke with reporters following Dana White's contender series season 4 week 3 and was asked about John's announcement on Monday that he was vacating the title. It's official. Yeah, Dana White said. While we were here, I actually went live on SportsCenter and announced it between one of the fights and announced all of that. It was also reported by ESPN on Monday that a fight between Dominic Reyes and John Blackowitz will take place September 26th at UFC 253. Multiple people with knowledge of the promotion's plans have confirmed the booking to MMA fighting. White would go on to confirm that the next big pay-per-view will now have two world title fights, with Israel Adesanya defending his middleweight title against Paula Costa in the main event. Yeah, it's for the vacant title. Dana White said he in regards to the fight between Dominic Reyes and John Blackowitz being the undisputed light heavy title. White would double down on the idea of Stipe Miocic who defeated Daniel Cormier in the main event of Saturday Night's UFC 22. If it's retain the title, it will t- uh, the next title fight will be Francis Ngannou versus Stipe Miocic for the heavyweight belt. As far as John Jones' heavyweight future goes, Dana White was not committal. I know that John right now wants to take time to do things that he wants to do. If you follow him on Instagram, he's been doing a lot of shooting. Likes to work with these attack dogs, lift a lot of weights, and I think he's having fun in his life a little bit. I think when this whole heavy thing plays out, we'll see what works best for him. It's really upsetting that we're not going to see the rematch between Reyes and John Jones, because me and a whole lot of people believe that Dominic Reyes should have defeated John Jones. Don't give me this nonsense where because John Jones was winning in the end, he should have won the fight in his totality. No, that's not how it works. You don't reward athletes for just doing good in the final minutes of a fight. You don't do that. Dominic Reyes objectively defeated John Jones in the first three rounds of the fights. Jones, he obviously won the last two rounds. But 3-2, Reyes should have won the fight. He really should have. And now, that's a door that seems to be closed because Dominic Reyes, you know, I'm, there's nothing coming up from his camp. It would be fun to see Dominic Reyes if he were to move up to heavyweight, because I can def- cause jo- Dominic Reyes, he's a big light heavyweight. He could definitely go and make it in into the heavyweight division. 100%. But first, let's see how Dominic Reyes fares himself against John Blackwoods. I'm right now looking at the light heavyweight rankings right now. With John Jones vacating his title, pretty much being undefeated at light heavyweight, thus cementing him as the greatest light heavyweight in UFC history. Good for him. Dang, that'd be big. The greatest light heavyweight of all time versus the greatest heavyweight of all time. Who would win? Jones versus Stipe Miocic. But that's if, you know, Miocic defeats Francis Ngannou. If Francis Ngannou defeats Stipe Miocic, would be, which would be a huge upset victory there. Jones versus Ngannou. Wow, and then can you imagine if Ngannou defeats Jones? How very different we would see Francis Ngannou. Very strange. Very, very strange. But I'm looking at the record. I'm looking at the record right now. Uh, Tiago Santos, he just recently lost to John Jones in a title fight. He's been fighting against Glover Teixeira in the week right. Yeah, the week right before the UFC 253 event. So my, I'm not thinking. Why isn't Tiago Santos? Why is he? Yeah, well, I guess you know 
John Blanco, he's coming off a you know a winning streak, while Diego Santos just came off a loss right now. So it makes sense that we're having the two fighters here who had the most like recent, the best recent performances going at it in Reyes and John Blockowitz. That's gonna be a scrapyard fight. That's gonna be a scrap fight. I wouldn't be surprised if that if, if that fight ended way earlier. I don't see that fight going five rounds. I just don't. It could at the earliest end in the third round. That's my educated guess there. That Dominic Reyes and John Blockowitz would go fight till you know. The middle or end half of the third round in terms of estimation. I wouldn't know who would win the fight. These two are so close in terms of skill and their, and their striking ability that I wouldn't know who exactly to pick in the matchup right there. But also looking at the heavier rankings here, well, we, we got Glover Teixeira against Diego Santos, Anthony Smith against Alexander Vikic. So Anthony Smith, his past three fights haven't all been that good. It really hasn't. Um, you know what? He had a knockout against Alexander Gustin, but his fight against Glover Teixeira was very telling of Anthony Smith. People are not questioning Anthony Smith. On is Anthony Smith is he is he a top five fighter in the light heavyweight division? Is he? He is going to be the favorite here against Alexander Rakish, definitely. But his performance against Glover Teixeira, Glover Teixeira right now, the dude is on a roll. I wouldn't be surprised if he fights the winner. Of Reyes versus John Blockwitz. So Dominic Reyes, John Blockwitz, winner of that fight, goes on to fight against Glover Shera. That is if Glover Shera, no, I don't know, obviously Glover Shera, Tiago Santos or Glover Shera now. So we got the big four of light heavy division that are all competitive. That's one of the blessings in disguise for John Jones retiring is that we have Dominic Reyes, Tiago Santos, John Blockwitz, and Glover Shera. Those four fighters, not being the biggest names in the industry, not being all that really big in terms of popularity, but for the hardcore MMA fans, we know that those four fighters are the best in the light heavy division. Other than Reyes, I don't think any of them can go take on John Jones in a light heavy title bout. But now that he's gone, we got four fighters of equal footing here. I hope Anthony Smith bounces back from his really, really, oh man, his performance against Silver Shirt was really bad. It really was. It just, uh, it, he just didn't look good in that one. And then we have, oh, coming up in the same card, NUFC 23, we have some Johnny Walker against Ryan Span. <laughs> I love Johnny Walker. Michael Bisping loves Johnny Walker. The dude looks like a star. He has natural charisma. That dude's a stud. He should fight a heavyweight. He, <laughs> that guy is, is he like 6'6? Six, six? He's like the 6'6, six, 5'6, six, six, six dude. Looks like the Terminator. I think Michael Bisping said it, said it in his own words. He says, Johnny Walker looks like he would be a robot from the Terminator. And he does. He has, Johnny Walker has it in terms of star power. It's just how, what is his actual ceiling in the rankings here? Because Johnny Walker, he's not some young sprite. I think he's like 35 years old now. He was the young prospect going up in the rankings here, but now he's no longer the young prospect anymore. He's against Ryan Span. Walker is coming off two losses. It makes all the sense of the world for. I'm looking at Ryan's thing here. Yeah, it looks like this seems like it would be a gimme fight for John Walker to go bounce back after two losses. His UFC record right now is three and two. It'd be really bad. I wouldn't be surprised if John Walker gets laid off if he gets if he goes three and three. He's got an impressive MMA career, but his UFC career is kind of. Eh. I'm surprised oh, Nikita Kurilov, I want to see him back in the UFC Octagon definitely again. I think he's one of the gems in the light heavy division right now. He's currently ranked number 11. So he's just right outside the top 10 in the rankings here. But because of COVID being an issue, uh, traveling issues, he's an international fighter. I can't expect him to fight in the Octagon anytime soon. Along with him and uh, Jiri Prochaska, those are other, those are, that's another good fighter who I really want to see move his way up in the rankings. I think Jerry has the potential to move up in the top five of the rankings in a light heavy division. I have that much stock in him. But you know what? Things are complicated in the UFC's rankings. We got fighters retiring. Fighters not retiring. We got fighters saying, oh yeah, I forgot so. This is so weird. I'm looking at the rankings right now. It's unsure about Anthony Rumble Johnson. So Anthony Rumble Johnson will be making his comeback to the UFC. Now at what division? 
probably heavyweights makes the most sense. Because last time I saw Anthony Johnson, and it was like in a random Instagram pic, the dude was gigantic. He was walking around well over 325 pounds. The dude was hunor- was just humongous. And I know Anthony Johnson, he is capable of dropping a lot of weights. It's so weird that at one point the guy was a welterweight. Really weird. But Anthony Johnson, uh, he could be making his way. I wouldn't be surprised if Anthony Johnson bypasses away and starts competing immediately in the top 10 of either life heavyweights or the heavyweight rankings. But I'm excited for the return of Anthony Rumble Johnson. And so you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. Coming back right after the short break here. See you soon. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So, I've been talking about the UFC light heavyweight rankings here. John Jones, he retired his light heavyweight belt, vacated it. Now he's going towards heavyweights, where it is expected that he's going to fight whoever wins between Sleepy Miocic versus Francis Ngannou. No matter who wins, Jones moving up to heavyweights, huge. If Jones can go and win the heavyweight belt, he'll be without a doubt, even there's a lot of asterisks to his career, he would be, without a doubt, the greatest UFC fighter of all time. Without a doubt about that. <laughs> I'm thinking about it because um, I just saw the recent video from MMA on Points where Daniel, where Daniel Cormier was doing interviews. And he was talking about how he compared himself to like Michael Jordan or Muhammad Ali. And that he wants to be you know, the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And then on the video, the person speaking at MMA MMA on points, and also Dana White, he said also, in that Daniel Cormier will forever be known as the second best heavyweight of all time, or the second best light heavyweight of all time. And I'm thinking about that, it's like, oh man, that's sad, that you'll forever be known as the second best. That's still, it's still a great accomplishment. Like, Daniel Cormier is a guaranteed Hall of Famer. He is an all-time great in the world of not just like UFC but mixed martial arts also. But man, you'll be forever known as the second greatest ever. Oh man. So, I don't know, so, so, that kind of sounds a little bit depressing there. But now we have Jean Blackwood against Dominic Reyes. They'll be competing at light heavyweight for the vacant title. But as I was looking at the rankings there, I remembered Anthony Rumble Johnson. This is coming from MMAfighter.com. Anthony Normal Johnson explains coming back to UFC after being against fighters who are turned in from retirements. Anthony Normal Johnson is finally ready to make his return to the UFC, but his comeback is happening despite his greater instinct about fighters who don't want to walk away. The former top contender actually retired back in 2017 after suffering a second round submission bit loss to Daniel Cormier in his bid to become the light heavy champion. Afterwards, Johnson kept his focus away from fighting... Uh, um, he took an ambassador role on um, the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships. But as time passed, John Jones started to feel to desire to compete again, and he made his intentions clear that he intended to return to fighting. Earlier this week, Anthony Rumble Johnson, Ali Abalada, uh, oh, Ali Abalaziz, it's hard to say his name, but Khabib's manager, confirmed plans for him to re-enter the UFC's anti-doping program, which requires six months of drug testing before he's allowed to fight again. According to Johnson, he actually been one of the strongest opponents against fighters returning from retirement, but he felt like he was in a different situation than many of the athletes who just don't know when to call quits. Honestly, I miss a sport, Johnson explained when he was asked about his UFC turn during a BKFC press conference. I don't, I, it upsets me so much 
the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships. Their thing is called the BKFC. Because I'm just saying, barbecue Kentucky Fried Chicken. Seriously, I'm hungry. I miss competing. So I know at one point I was against guys coming back from retirement. You usually see them getting mopped up. BJ Penn came back, got mopped. I've seen everybody that came out of retirement get mopped up. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon for fighters to return from retirement only to find a less than successful future awaiting them. Johnson knows he's in a different situ- situ- uh, situation because he walked away just moments after he competed for a UFC title. Add to that, with three years away from the sports and still being just 36, Johnson had time to allow his mind and body to heal as he embarks on another run in the UFC. I just don't want to be one of those guys to get mopped up, but I still feel good. I have no injuries while I was in the UFC. I didn't get hit much unless I lost, That was and that wasn't often. Anthony Rumble Johnson did confirm his intention to compete in the light heavyweight division, despite previously hinting at a return of heavyweights. Well, there goes my prediction being wrong there. I thought he would be so perfect for heavyweights. But then again, Anthony Rumble Johnson, he lost against the best, Daniel Cormier and John Jones at light heavyweights. Anthony Romo Johnson was smoking everybody in the light heavy division. Not only that, Anthony Romo Johnson is huge. The guy is gigantic. There's no way that man is going to the octagon fighting at 205 pounds. No way. Absolutely not. Because I'm walking around at 228, 230 between there right now. And I look way significantly small. And I work out a lot. I do a lot of like weightlifting stuff and like bodybuilding stuff. And I'm telling you right now, Anthony Johnson, if you told me Anthony Johnson is 30 pounds or 25 pounds smaller, smaller than me, I would not believe it. The dude is huge. So John Jones just vacated his title and Courtney has seemingly retired from the UFC. It appears Dominic Reyes and John Blackwoods are in collision. Anthony Johnson added that he currently has a couple more fights on his current UFC deal. But he's not setting an expectation about his future yet until he finally makes a return. So, Anthony Romo Johnson coming back to the UFC light heavyweight rankings. Surprise about that. Based on Anthony Romo Johnson's performance when he was a light heavyweight three years ago. Oh man, dude. It would be a complete slobber knocker for him in the rankings here. Because imagine... Jump, Rumble Johnson against Reyes, Rumble Johnson against Thiago Santos, Rumble Johnson against Anthony Lanhart Smith, against John Blackowitz. It's just, the guy would make an awesome light heavyweight in his performances though. Now I would love to see Anthony Johnson against Francis Ngannou, the battle of two big dudes, two studs. I still remember Alistair Overeem versus Brock Lesnar. That entire fight was built around the idea of like, if you remember the commercials, just, just look, just type up Alistair Overeem versus Brock Lesnar on YouTube, watch the commercials. The commercials is just basically, hey, this guy is six foot six, 265 pounds. This guy is six foot five, 250 pounds. Let's see what happens when these two square off in the ring. It's, <laughs> it's like the heavy, it was, was it for the heavy title? No, it wasn't for the heavy title. No, it wasn't. It was, uh, it was just, it was built around the idea of like, look at these two dudes who are big and they're gonna fight each other because they're big. <laughs> I wanna see super heavyweights Anthony Robo Johnson fight against Francis Ngannou. Because Francis Ngannou, he has to shed some weight just to make the limit of, two, of 265 in the heavy division. And so, Francis Ngannou, normally when he walks around, is even bigger than he actually looks in the octagon. Oh man, dude. Battle of the Beefheads. Beefcakes. Battle of Studs. Well, I'm overall excited for Anthony Romo Johnson's return. Now, he says he has to go through a drug testing period. He should be able, he should do it right now, or as soon as possible. Considering the fact that, you know, with COVID being a real issue right now, we can't expect audiences to make a big comeback. Things are a little inconsistent right now. It makes all the sense in the world right now for Anthony Roma Johnson to go do his drug testing right now. And then be able to go move, you know, and then after the six month period, which is when the whole COVID-19 pandemic should end, everything becomes all stabilized. It makes sense for Anthony Roma Johnson to be stabilized after the six month period. 
So this is coming in from MMAJunkie.usatoday.com. Is Joe Adesanya is open to following John Jones to heavyweight after the after, oh what the hell? Is Joe Adesanya open to following John Jones to heavyweight after he vacated the UFC title? Hey, look at Is Joe Adesanya? He dyes his hair pink. Well, you know he's a he's a weeb, so I expect nothing more from him. So Is Joe Adesanya thinks it's about time John Jones is committed to moving up to the heavy division. So Jones moves up, and Is Joe Adesanya goes on to say, goes up oh, goes on to say this. Look how long it took him to move up to heavyweight, Adesanya told reporters, including MMA Junkie, during Tuesday's UFC 253 media call. Finally, he was expecting me to do it straight away, but I hadn't defended my belt yet. I defended my belt twice now, I'm going to defend it a few more times, and then do what I set out to do. But yeah, the pot calling the kettle black on his part, go put some muscle on your chopstick legs and go, you know, effing fight for Senganu. To watch him break you. I hope he doesn't though. Maybe he does. Who knows? Despite Jones' move, uh, Adesanya says he's not taking the matchup off the table. Adesanya has said in the past that fighting at heavyweight is part of his own career path. So it's possible that, there, that that's where he could eventually meet John Jones. 100% it doesn't change my plans. My plan is still going forward as planned. So yeah, same thing. First and foremost though, Adesanya has a task of defending his belt against Paula Costa at 185, coming up September 26. That would be a dream fight, man. Adesanya versus John Jones. It would be great. People would pay money to see that because they're both interesting, very dynamic fighters. And isn't John Jones recently has transitioned into being more of a counterfighter more than anything else, especially in his fight against Dominic Reyes. And that note, when he was winning the fight against Reyes, it was mostly like Reyes very struggling, like very tiredly, pressing the action towards John Jones and then Jones would counterfight. And so for Jones against Izzy Adesanya, it'd be a battle between two counterfighters going at it. It would be interesting as an MMA fan to see how the two fighters would screw up against each other. Because both of them, in terms of like the physicals, the character, the physical characteristics, are so similar. It's it's the best matchup we can think of, other than peak Anderson Silva versus peak uh, John Jones. Cause I still remember, I think it was UFC two. Yeah, it was UFC two. Yeah, so it was UFC two, and if you play the demo for UFC two, it was <laughs> it was middleweight champion Anderson Silva. Versus light heavy champion John Jones, like they were the first two fighters you see when you played UFC two. They were the two highest rated fighters in the entire game. And for a demo, it's like, all right then, champion versus champion. And it's always been a matchup that people have always wondered who would win between the peak version of Anderson Silva versus light heavy champion John Jones. Who would win that matchup? And now. Adesanya pretty much is working as the proxy for Silva in that both Silva and Adesanya they're both very similar fighters also as well so it'd be Adesanya versus John Jones would be the proxy for Anderson Silva versus John Jones who would win in a matchup between Jones and Adesanya man who would actually win in that matchup there I like to say that Jones is going to win just because he's slightly bigger than Adesanya. And he's, and John Jones right now, he's slowing down. And if both fighters were to move up to heavyweight, I can see John Jones being a little bit more slower than Adesanya. Then again, I just can't imagine Adesanya fighting at heavyweights. I just can't. Yeah, I think he normally walks around at like 215, 210. Like Adesanya is a natural light heavyweight. Him and Paulo Costa, are natural light heavyweights. Paulo Costa, he can fight a heavyweight, but he would have to, he would have to gain even more weight because the guy's already jacked as it is, and he's at two thirty. If you haven't checked up on his Instagram stuff, but yeah, Costa, that's cheating. <laughs> that these two fighters who are so big are fighting light heavyweights. So this is Dominic Reyes. Dominic Reyes should compete a heavyweight, but he's competing on light heavyweights. I remember I, I, there was a video that popped up. That was talking about whether there actually even is an advantage for fighters who are fighting lower than their actual weight class is. And I think it was for Robert Whitaker and Darren Till. In that fighters who attempt attempt to fight one weight class down always end up struggling. Like we see it in 
I think uh, Chris, we say it, but no, did Chris Hammond mess it up though? I don't, uh, I'm not sure. So it's Luke Rockhold. So Luke Rockhold, he fought one weight division down, and then he just got completely mopped. It didn't went well, went, went, well for, well, went well for him. Darren Till and Robert Whitaker are two are two fighters that tried fighting lower in the rankings, but are not all that successful. And it was until they made their way up in the rankings they actually like fought more better. And then Robert Whitaker, what made him becoming because Robert Whitaker has been in the UFC for a couple of years. Like he's he's a proper veteran of the sport, but he was never really he never really excelled up until he moved up into middleweight. That at one point he was competing at welterweight, and it just wasn't doing all that well for him. But until he moved up to the middleweight rankings, they started improving. And the same thing also applied to like Michael Bisping also. And that like the you just become a better fighter moving up. You just become unless you're, unless you're Chris Weidman. But for the most part, based off recent history, fighters fight better. When they move up in rankings, at least that's how it should be. I felt like Uriah Hall, uh, moving up in, no, no, OSP. I thought OSP competing at heavyweight was really good for him. I thought, I think OSP fighting at heavy division is a lot more better than him fighting at light heavyweight. He feels a lot more faster, surprisingly. He feels a lot more smoother. The weight cutting isn't all that damaging for him. And so for Jones making his transition to the heavyweight division, I think it'd be very smooth. Alexander Gustafson, Although he lost his fight against uh, against Fabrice Verdum, he looked really good in his performance. He, he looked just as fast as he was in light heavyweights. And so for Adesanya, you know, if all these other fighters are doing good when they move up rankings, I can see Adesanya becoming a better fighter if you're to move up at heavyweights, maybe. And so you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast, coming back right after a short break here. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So, multiple matches have just been announced. So as they're being said here, it is coming from Brett Okamoto from ESPN. Brian Ortega, Chan Sung Jung to headline UFC Fight Night on October 17. Ortega with Chan Sung Jung. Wow, that fight is without a doubt going to be a fight of the year candidate. Without a doubt about it, that card. Man, you know what's really upsetting? Those two would probably make the loudest noise if they were to fight in a large crowd. So this is coming from Akamura. The 145 pound contest was was originally supposed to take place in Jung's native South Korea, but Ortega was forced to withdraw. Was forced to withdraw because of a knee injury. Chang Sung Jung ended up staying on the card and knocking out former lightweight champion Frankie Edgar. Ortega of Los Angeles and Jung have gone back and forth on social media ever since. Ortega is 14 and one, hasn't fought since he challenged the then champion Max Holloway for the UFC Championship in December 2018, one of the best fights of the entire year of the year 2018. Ringside physicians stopped the fight after the fourth round. It was his first loss of the 29-year-old's professional career. Chang Sung Jung has been in a terror since returning from a four-year absence from the sports uh, after serving in the South Korean military. He's 31 years old. He's three and one since coming back with the first-round knockouts over Dennis Bermudez, Renato Mukiano, and Frankie Edgar. His only loss came in against Riyad Riguez, in which he was knocked out in the final second of the bout. He was leading on the scorecards. So Chang Sung Jung, Brian Ortega, both of these guys coming off layoffs. 
Oh man, who would win this match here? So obviously Brian Ortega, Shang Tsung Jung, they both have iron jaws. I don't see either of them getting knocked out. I just don't. Although both although Chang Sung Jung has been knocked out, the likelihood of seeing it again again is it Ryan Rodriguez, top elite level striker, one of the best strikers of all the UFC divisions. Yar Rodriguez is a better striker than Ortega. While Ortega, he, like his striking is really good, he still mostly relies on his iron jaw. And when he taking into fact how okay, besides both of them are really good grapplers, also both of them very good on the ground doing jiu-jitsu. So this probably is a very even matchup. I'll be leaning towards the Brian Ortega just because Ortega, Chang Sung Jung is the better striker. Ortega is the better grappler, but both of them can strike and both of them can grapple. But I'm leaning towards usually in a grappler versus striker exchange. I say Ortega is going to win that matchup. But dang, October 17, a week right before Halloween for the Korean for the Korean Zombie. Ironically, I will cheer for Brian Ortega in that matchup. There, I think he will go and best out. Chang Sung Jung. Another matchup, Curtis Blades and Derek Lewis to top UFC Fight Night card in November is coming in also from Brett Okamoto. All these matchups are being announced by ESPN. A heavy bout between ranked contenders Curtis Blades and Derek Lewis will headline a UFC Fight Night event in November. Both sides have agreed to the heavyweight matchup which will take place on November 28th in probably the Apex Facility Building. It's a fight Blades and Blades publicly asked for. Last week, immediately after Lewis picked up a victory against Alexei Olenek on a UFC Fight Night card in Las Vegas. I'm happy and excited about it, Blaze told ESPN. This is the one I asked for, and I'm happy for the UFC listened and made it a main event. I know Derek Lewis is a name, and his large following and win over him will solidify my case as the next one in line for the heavyweight title. I know Francis Ngannou is up next, and I want to build my case to go after him. Sadly, no, John Jones is way too much of a big name. And if he's up for it to go fight either Stipe or Francis Ngannou, I don't see Curtis... No, I can see Curtis Blades having a fight. He might have a, he might have a title fight sometime in the near future. After the Jones fiasco gets kind of settled down. But yeah, man, uh, this really is a must win for both fighters, for both Derek Lewis and for, and for Curtis Blades. I feel like if either of them were to lose this fight, they would have to go and win their next two fights, potentially even three fights, to go and compete for the heavyweight title. It's that, that a one loss is going to set them back years. So, Lewis versus Curtis Blades. Wow, that's going to be a scrap fight. That's going to be a scrap fight. Uh, Curtis Blades, a great striker, great grappler. Derek Lewis, in my review for the UFC Fight Night, to which he fought against Alex Olenek, I said, technical grappling expert Derek Lewis. I remember last week I was looking at uh, yeah, like hot takes of mixed martial arts. And one hot take was, Derek Lewis is... The one-dimensional fighter who gets away with being one-dimensional because he fights against low-ranked guys. I was shocked that people were betting on Derek Lewis to defeat Alexei Olenek. I was shocked. Because when I looked at that, I was like, okay, there is no way, no, like, 100%, I would bet all the money I have on the idea that Derek Lewis would not outgrapple Alexei Olenek. No way. Alexei Olenek is the greatest. He's the greatest submission artist in UFC heavyweight history. And you mean to tell me that Derek Lewis is going to outgrapple this guy? Are you kidding me? <laughs> he's going to outgrapple with a dude who outgrappled against Fabrice Verdum and out of shape Fabrice Verdum, but still an amazing grappler in Olenek. And Derek Lewis out wrestles him, out jiu him. It's a complete spectacle to watch Alexa Linick and Derek Lewis. And that also, if you look at Derek Lewis's boxing, it's a lot more cleaner, a lot more crisp. Derek Lewis has moved camps. He's got a new coach. He's been working a lot more on his cardio and then on his grappling a lot more. Dang, I don't know what to expect off of Lewis. Curtis Blades is a highlight reel fighter. Sadly, he'll forever be known as that guy who just got murked by Francis Ngannou. But trust me, Blade's a tough hombre. Him and Derek Lewis, man, I don't know who would win that matchup. I don't know. I'm going to say Derek Lewis is going to defeat Curtis Blades. You know why I say I say Derek Lewis? Just because I was so heavy, I mean, I was so immediate on Derek Lewis losing to Alexa Linick. 
and I was wrong in that my prediction there, that I want to make it up by predicting that Dark Lewis is going to defeat Curse Blades. That's how I see it. And so Curse Blades has a tendency of like going through striking. Dark Lewis will beat him to striking. Curse Blades is Curse Blades, based off a cumulative performance, a cumulative performances, is a better grappler. But then again, the recent iteration of Derek Lewis and that him being able to out Matt wrestle Alexa Linick, I just don't know what to expect. I really don't know. I say Lewis wins this because he, I like him. Also, Curtis Blades, he had the misfortune of coming out to the Mortal Kombat theme song and getting his butt whooped. No. Just no. So UFC books Mauricio Shogun Hua against Paul Craig, a rematch for November 21. The light heavyweights fought to a split draw in November 2019. Since then, both fighters are 1-0 and with Hua scoring a split decision win over his rival Antonio Ruggiero Nogueira in July. And Craig submitting, uh, uh, I'm sorry if I can't say his name correctly, Gadhumad Antigolov also last month. Ooh, this will be a really fun one. I will always cheer for Mauricio Shogun Hua. He, to me, is my favorite fighter of all time. He got me into mixed martial arts, and so that's why I'm choosing him. So, Anthony Romo Johnson right now, he's entering mandatory drug testing, uh, drug testing period right now. Ooh. A pair of brothers, two, uh, a pair of brothers, two others awarded UFC contracts on the Contender Series. Lewis and Orin Costco became the first pair of brothers to compete on Dana White's Contender Series on Tuesday, and the first pair of brothers to sign UFC contracts on the show. UFC President Dana White offered contracts to, uh, contracts to both fighters, Lewis 24 and Orion 26. Following their respective wins at the, UFP, at the UFC Apex facility building in Las Vegas, the victories could not have looked any different. Lewis smoked Victor Reyna in a 72 second knockout while Orion battled back from a hole, in a, from hole to upset a heavily favorite Matt Dixon via TKO, which is 18 seconds left in the fight. Ironically, the two fighters have actually been overshadowed by 25-year-old strawweight Chain Baez, who dominated Hilda Rose in a unanimous decision. Baez looked incredibly sharp on the feet, and although she didn't deserve, a, she didn't secure a finish, showed a real mean streak in the 15-minute fight. She later admitted she doesn't love to finish fights; she prefers to do gangster stuff. Okay, no, you always prefer to finish a fight when you can. All right, then, when you can, you always aim to finish a fight. Stalling out is not gangster. It really isn't. Immediately after that, Baez approached White and said she'd be direct messaging him on social media for years with no response. The UFC president handed her his phone and Baez wrote herself a response from that, uh, oh. Baez herself a response from it so she'd finally have one. What do I say about Shane? What don't I say about her? Dana White said. Her striking is unbelievable. Her ground is awesome. She's mean. Awesome. She's cocky. She's 5-1 now. She's not even in her prime. She's young. She's a baby. I like her very much and I expect things from Cheon, from Cheon Baez. And all the UFC awarded four of the five winning contestants on Tuesday a contract. Both Luis and Orion compete in the 170 pound division in addition to them and Baez. White also awarded a contract to Josh Pearson, who fights at heavyweight, who scored a first round knockout over Chad Johnson. Chad Johnson has to be the most generic name I can ever think of for an athlete ever, being honest with you. Pershian became the 10th fighter in Contender Series history to win over the show twice. Once in 2019 and on Tuesday, all 10, uh, all 10 of the two-time winners have ended up receiving a contract. Lightweight Kenny Cross was the only winner to not receive a contract. He defeated the previously unbeaten Kevin Tyler via unanimous decision. Cross looked sluggish from the second round on, which might have caused by circumstances. He was supposed to fight against Skyler two weeks ago on the Contender Series, but the fight was postponed after Skyler tested positive on COVID-19. That meant Cross ended up cutting weight for the contest twice in a two-week span. The UFC has now awarded 12 new UFC contracts through the first three weeks of the 2020 Contender Series. Man, while everyone is holding back on their money, they're giving these fighter contracts. Hopefully their contracts are good. I'm going to guess right now. Their contracts are worth like... Around $30,000 per fight. That's my prediction. Israel Adesanya says, Paula Costa says some really dumb stuff. Reading UFC Billy Champion, Israel Adesanya has been firing on Paula Costa, has been firing on Paula Costa a lot. The trash, uh, so these two have a history. It was, an, it was rumored that it was going to be Paula Costa versus Israel Adesanya for the Ultimate Fighter. Now that, that has been scrapped, sadly. 
Dana White says that he's still currently working on the UFC fighter, that he is going to go and revitalize his show. But right now, those two are not the names. Israel Adesanya goes on to say, he might need a filter because he says a lot of dumb stuff sometimes, Adesanya said on Costa during a video conference call with a group of reporters. Like he called himself the king of, I'm not going to say it, of bitches. Maybe he should put on a filter on sometimes because after I knock him out, I'm just going to carry him on my on my day. So these two are just like mouthing off at each other. Me and Costa have been two of the rising forces of the UFC. It was going to take a while to build up as our own entities and then have a super fight like we were now, like we are now. Remember when he said he doesn't know who I am? Well, you know who I am now. This is perfect. What I was expecting for my last fight. This is going to happen. This fight, as I said, in my story, you can just have, have it going great. You need a dip. You need a valley when things go wrong. That was me for my last fight after my performance against Romero brought. I never been in a, I've never been in a boring fight in my life, but that was a dip. This is a rise back and what better antagonistic antagonist is Paulo Costa. I think it's great for me because of the aesthetics. I'm a skinny person, the little frail kid, and he looks like the perfect antagonist. He's a big, bulky juice to the effing grills, and he's a guy who beats everyone on the fence. So when I come in there with some Bruce Lee stuff and F him up, the casuals are going to be, are going to feed off it. It means more eyes, more attention, and I love it. So Polo Costa. So it's claimed by Polo Costa on his Instagram that he walks around 220. Don't believe it. I just don't. <laughs> but when asked if Costa's size is a concern, Adesanya made it clear he's not all bothered by it. Nope. I fought a heavyweight in boxing and kickboxing, and I plan on fighting heavyweight in MMA at some point. Size makes a difference if you know how to use it, but they are always surprised when they step across a cage from me and they realize how long I am. They are always in for a rude awakening. I don't know why people think it's going to be a heavy factor. I'm used to this. So, this also comes from the tail end of Ezra Adesanya calling out John Jones, saying that he'll be following John Jones at some point in the near future, in a couple years on the line. Ezra Adesanya says he expects to defend his belt a couple more times, and after that, make the transition into heavyweight. Hmm. I think... Izzy would be perfect for light heavyweights. That's what I believe. I think he can merc anyone in the light heavy division. But if he plans to go on heavyweights and just bypass the light heavy division, man, I think that's a huge risk. Israel Desanya has fought at heavyweight at kickboxing, but I've seen him boxing and kickboxing at heavyweights. He looks so slow and sluggish. And in the MMA level, I don't think he can keep up with that. I just don't. I think him bypassing the heavyweight might be a mistake. And so once again, you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. Gonna come back right after a short break here with some more MMA news. And also, I'll be talking about the hot takes of mixed martial arts. See you soon. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores a goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And we are back. And so it is reported that Anderson Silva is going to be fighting against Uriah Hall on October 31. That will be a very stellar fun matchup there. I can't wait to see that one. That could potentially be a fight that you candidate for all we know. And then it's also being reported that Corey Anderson reveals why swapping UFC for Bellator was a no-brainer. Corey Anderson was a top fighter in the UFC and then he's now made a transition into Bellator. Corey Anderson excited to bring in a new chapter to his career while hitting a while hitting at a throwback to a key element of his past. Corey Anderson, 13-5, 0 0 in his Belter career, was granted his release by the UFC and swiftly signed with Belter, where he looks to set a slot into the promotion as an instant contender for the light heavy title. Speaking with MMA Junkie, Corey Anderson explains his decision, making the process, and why he cho- what chose what led him to choosing Belter. The end thing that I came to was at the end of the day, it's a calculation risk, just like a fight. Both organizations, UFC and Bellator, 
If you got some risk, you can go out there and you can get knocked out, arm broke, anything could happen. Now, one has the UFC belt, one has the Belter belt, one doesn't have sponsors, one has sponsors, one is only paying you a medium, when the other one is paying you for your worth. That's the calculated risk you're gonna take. After weighing the offers and assessing those key differences between the two promotion, Anderson won four of his last five fights, came to the conclusion that moving to Bellator was clearly the right decision for him and his family. I'm going to take more money, a belt, more opportunity, and the same risk that I would in a top organization. So to me, it was a no-brainer. I'd be stupid if I passed up this opportunity because I want those three letters in front of the words champ. So I went from UFC to Bellator on that. I can bring sponsors back, and Beeson 2528 is my company brand. So I can just uh, put on my Beeson 2528 on the shorts and still rep the name OT because the company is still Beeson 258 LLC. So, Corey Anderson pretty much, uh, I'll summarize it here. You're making more money in the, you're making more money in Bellator. Alright then. He's making a lot more money in Bellator. Brendan Schaub said that you are not going to the UFC to make money. No, no, you're not going to the UFC to make the most money. That's how, that's how you put it down. You're going to the UFC because the brand of UFC. That's uh, pretty much about it, though. Um, so I know somebody. What's well, okay, I know somebody who works at Google. I always bring this up. My friend who works at Google and Facebook. I have two friends who work at not three. So yeah, I have those friends who work at Google and Facebook. But I also know. I also know another person who works for a private tech company. So, the private tech company, uh, I don't remember it, he says it's a private tech company that no one knows, but, but, but he claims that he makes the same amount of money as a software developer for this company, uh, in his, like, running, running the website and, like, making sure the servers are all fine. He makes the same amount of money doing that for a private tech company than he does working at Facebook or at Google. Because I have friends right now who, some of them make 300k, some of them make at, make at 100k, some of them make 120k. My friend works at a private company, makes about 150k. So my friend makes 150k, is working at a private tech company that nobody's ever heard of, but is making more money than, uh, than my friends who are currently working at Facebook or at Google. And unless you're very, very special, you'll be making 300k like all my other friends at the highest level for Google. And the same thing applies for UFC in that if you're not the elite of the elite, if you're not Khabib, if you're not John Jones, if you're not Conor McGregor, if you're not a world champion and you're knocking and you're not winning your fight the night bonuses or you're not getting any of your bonuses then really you might as well just go for Bellator you might as well this is also coming off the heels of Paige Van Zandt saying that she's I think I think she's making minimum twice she's making at the minimum twice as much money under her new bare knuckle fighting championship contract than she is for the FC, and also she's getting more opportunities to do so. So, and so there's also the reason why we see a lot of um, a lot of people. The contender series, twelve contracts were handed out. We have twelve new fighters coming into the UFC, and they're all being paid probably the minimum of like thirty k per fight. So, best case scenario for these fighters here, they only make they make thirty thousand dollars. By the way, thirty thousand dollars. The older you get, <laughs> here's one thing. When you're 18 to 19 years old, $100 is a lot of money. When you're 21, 20 years old, $100 becomes chump change. When you're 30 years old, $100 becomes you can literally just toss it away. You can like you can you can make it back depending on the career path that you're kind of going for. I'm lucky. I'm lucky for myself that 100 bucks is like not not nothing really. $100 is not a lot for me at all at this point in my life. But we got to think about these fighters here. Even though they're older, where they are right now, currently in their career, making thirty thousand dollars off a fight is a lot of money. And if these fighters were to compete twice a year, and were to yeah compete twice a year, and were to go get their win bonuses, they could potentially make about seventy, eighty thousand dollars off one year fighting, which is pretty all right. The average salary for the average American, I okay. <laughs> The average American makes up fifty-six thousand dollars per year, while the average salary in California is about like sixty-three thousand a year. If you live in Northern California, by the way, if you live in Northern California, the average salary in NorCal in the San Francisco Bay Area is about one hundred thousand dollars. 
Yeah, $100,000. Making $100,000 is the average basic salary if you live in the San Francisco area. And if you live in the Palo Alto area, making $250,000 means that you are making the average basic normal everyday person salary. A quarter of a million dollars. A quarter of a million. And, you know... You could, you could, you could be like a Chael Sonnen or a Ben Askren. And you could be like, well, guess, yeah, you, you guys are making a lot, you guys are still making money. You're making, you know, $60,000. That's more than the average American. So you should be humble and be, should, you should be appreciative that you're making a whole lot of money. There's that idea, but fighters like Chael Sonnen and a Ben Askren, there's a reason why their, their career only went up to a certain level. We can admit that. Now, I like both of them as fighters. Chael Sonnen's career will forever be known as that trash-talking fighter who was never good enough to become champion, so he had to go rely on his talking ability. But he's never he's never going to... like Chael Sonnen will never be in the same boat in terms of high pedigree or even as impactful or as, pop, or as popular as any of the recent UFC champions, whether it be Jones, whether it be Stipe Miocic, whether it be Daniel Cormier, Conor McGregor. No, like even Sean O'Malley... Has a higher ceiling of superstardom than either of those two fighters. The only fighters who are defending, who are defending low con- low money, low contracts for mixed martial arts, are those who don't necessarily pay attention or look at the grand scheme of things of athletes and their pay. Because you know, I can can you imagine Chael Sonnen or Ben Askren or or any of those fighters who are like who like who defend like UFC contracts. If they're to, if they're to talk to LeBron James, you'd be like, LeBron, I know you're being paid thirty million dollars per year, but here's the thing: you should be appreciative of the fact that you're making a lot of they should, that you're making a lot of money. So here's one hundred thousand dollars. One hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money they can go live off for. You can go and that's really good for your family. That's good for your kids' education. That's good for a house. One hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, LeBron James. LeBron James would look at you and think you're the biggest idiot schmuck in the world who doesn't know how to think for himself. Honestly, he'd be like, $400,000? I make $30 million right now. Why do I have to settle for $100,000 if I know I can go make $30 million? Wow, all because you believe you're worth $100,000 doesn't mean that I believe I'm worth $100,000. And I've proven it that I'm worth over $100,000. And I've proven it that I'm worth $30 million. So no. I'm not gonna be an idiot who's gonna settle with $100,000. And I would be happy if in the world of mixed martial arts, there needs to be more money. If more money is being, is being pushed to the UFC, if the UFC, now, their inflation rate of money and their salaries have been increasing, but at the rate of it increasing is so, so bare bones weak compared to the NBA, to compared to the NHL, compared to the NFL. The the amount of money the UFC is making is so small compared to other major sporting organizations that you you can easily laugh it off. You can. Now, UFC, big name, good, but I'm I'm happy for Corey Anderson. I'm happy for Paige Bazanz that they know how to go and, you know, make as much money as they possibly can considering how mixed martial arts doesn't bring in that much money in the first place. So there goes my little mini rank there. Now let's go to the hot takes here. I found one funny hot take that... Henry Cejudo can beat every MMA fighter on earth. I would love to see Henry Cejudo against Francis Ngannou. Legit, like legit. I think that would be an awesome fight to see. <laughs> oh, the dream fights of Demetrius Johnson versus Stephen Shrew will never happen. But I'd love to see it. Another hot take. Wonder Boy Stephen Thompson beats Kamaru Usman and Colby. And he's already out of style fight against Jorge Masvidal. Uh, I don't see Kamar Usman beating one. I, don't, I mean, I don't see Wonder Boy defeating Kamar Usman. I just don't. Kamar Usman is smart enough as a fighter to recognize, okay, I'm not going to be like Tyron Woodley, where I'm super afraid of getting kicked. I'm just going to endure it, and I'm going to just go and power my way through and stomp Wonder Boy Stephen Thompson. Yeah. Uh, Chael is a punk dude. Nope, Chael is just trying to make as much money as he can with his voice. Um, Tony Ferguson has been overrated and might be the fifth best fighter in his weight class. I think Khabib, Poirier, Gaethje, and McGregor all beat him. His best win was against RDA, who could barely make 155, and that was during the downturn of RDA. And he struggled against Pettis and Kevin Lee, 
and Lana Veneta. Oliveira and Islam perhaps could beat him. I always say Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira in, ha, is the most underrated fighter in all of UFC. I think Oliveira can can definitely give Khabib Nurmagomedov a run for his money. And it'd be a fun matchup if we see Oliveira versus um, Tony Ferguson. That'd be a fun one. I would be excited to see that. But is he overrated? I don't know. It's not. It's not. It's not that he's he's won his matchups. Yeah, all because you're not defeating somebody like like knocking him out within 13 seconds. That doesn't mean that you're not a good fighter. And I say he's a better fighter than Dustin Poirier. He's a better all around fighter than Conor McGregor. But then again, it doesn't matter who is the more better all around fighter, who's the more versatile fighter. All that matters is who would win in a fight between these two and whose arms would be raised. I like to see Conor McGregor against Tony Ferguson. That'd be a fun matchup, but we don't know what the status is right now on uh, Tony Ferguson and Connor. You don't know. <laughs> Zabit is overrated. Zabit, he's in the process right now where he is definitely being tested. Uh, Khabib exposed the sorry state of MMA grappling today, like Anderson Silva exposed the sorry state of MMA striking back in the day when Sprawl and Brawl went out went out of style. Huh. I would like to see more grapplers in the top. Yeah, here's the thing. Here's the truth. The lightweight division is mostly comprised of striker first. A striker is very striker heavy. Charles Oliveira and Kevin Lee are both magnificent grapplers, but they went through a period of time where they were focusing heavily on the striking. And Khabib is one of the only fighters who's like, you know what? I know I'm great in wrestling. I don't care if people don't like my boxing. But I'll just wrestle. Um, the lightweight division is just, just isn't, yeah, it's not grappler dominance. It really isn't. Like, Usman versus Khabib or Oliveira versus Khabib would be really fun, unique, fun matchups. I wasn't all that excited for Desmond Poirier versus Khabib just because I know how that fight's gonna end off. Now, there's a lot of hype behind Gaethje versus Khabib just because Gaethje has that wrestling pedigree background, even though he doesn't like wrestling. So yeah, um, here's the thing. even if people think wrestling is boring and it does get really boring, I would like it to release least some diversity in the, in the top cut rankings of the lightweight division because lightweight division is like grappler Khabib, then striker, 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 Charles Oliveira grappler, striker, striker. Yeah, I like to see like some grapplers, some strikers. I like to see more representation of grapplers in the lightweight division. But yeah, lightweight division right now in terms of diversity. It's not really all there. Okay, then uh, Ben Askren is the most overrated and underrated fighter in MMA. He was underrated in his time in Bellator. He is overrated in his time in the UFC. So yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm going to go for there. Ben Askren, he understands and he gets the game. He understands how to promote himself and he understands how to play to the crowd. And he's a great character. But by the time he went to the UFC, he just wasn't... Honestly, it just wasn't good for him. It really wasn't. Francis loses to John Jones and Stephen Miocic. We don't know yet. Um, I think Francis Ngannou has improved significantly. I think we'd have a better showing of Francis when he, if he were to fight against Stephen Miocic again. There's that idea. Um, I don't think Conor McGregor can make 145 anymore. No, 155. GSP was on steroids or was on competition. He didn't pop. But he looked freakishly jacked in his fight against Michael Bisping. Eh, makes sense. And according to Nick Diaz, they say that every fighter is on something. I can't say that they're right, but I could see it. It's understandable. I, I, it's understandable. Considering the fact that there like, there's like a lot of like drug tests going on. And it's like guaranteed there's going to be a fighter every single year that will be popped. So, if someone were to tell me that, GS, that GSP actually was on something, I would believe it. But he wasn't popped for it, so eh, I can't really make a judgment call. And that brings us to a close for today's podcast. You have been a great audience. All I gotta say is thank you. Thank you for listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you. And have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.